Strategic planning might seem complicated, but it doesn't need to be. Empower Envision facilitates collaboration, helping you strategize and execute your business plan more efficiently, saving time and money. Featuring interactive strategy dashboards, powerful visualization tools, and real-time communication, Empower Envision meets you where you are, where you work, and where you plan. Don't just create a strategy, see it happen. Learn more about how Empower Envision can help your organization today. There is a, to me, mind-buckling number out there, and that is the number 85%. As we know from Gallup, a study, 85% of our employees in the workforce, they don't feel engaged in their work. That to me, like given all the effort we put into this topic of getting engagement right over the years, that to me is an unmitigated disaster that we're still not getting it right. The good news is there's bright spots. There are people out there who have found out how to create real engagement in the workplace. And we have one of them with us today here, namely Michelle Stacy. Michelle Stacy has had a fantastic career. She has most recently been the president of Curic. She has had leadership positions at Gillette and Procter & Gamble. She has spent 35 years figuring out how to get this challenge of engagement right. Joining her is Whitney Johnson, who's one of my favorite thinkers on this topic. Uh, she's a fellow HBR author. She is an executive advisor. She's a terrific speaker. And recently, she was named as one of the top 50 business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to hear from Michelle Stacy and Whitney Johnson in the topic called Full Engagement Leadership. Michelle, it is so nice to meet you. And it was really fun to read in your bio. And everybody has this really important and impressive bio. But you said that you're an avid skier. So tell us where you ski and how you decided to learn how to ski. So I ski at Park City or Deer Valley outside of Salt Lake City because I have a home out here. In fact, you're talking to me today um, from my home in Park City. And I think next week when we're all together again, you'll be talking to me from Massachusetts. So I go back and forth quite a bit between the two homes. I learned to ski as a youngster. Um, interestingly, my mother learned how to ski in the 1930s. And so when skiing came to the United States, she brought me to the mountain and started to teach me how to ski and it stuck. Oh, and she learned how to ski because your parents emigrated from France to the United States. So she learned how to ski in France. In the Alps. Yep. When you had to walk up the mountain, there were no lifts. <laughs> mm, I love that. All right. Well, that's interesting. And probably in many ways, she was a trailblazer learning how to ski in the 1930s. And so... I think that's a fitting prelude to the conversation that we're going to have today about transformation. So this entire conference is about transformation, transformation of your business, transform. That's a hard word to say, transformation of yourself. And so it's interesting in looking at the course of your career, you've made two really big decisive moves where you stepped back and you were very clear that you did this for your family. And we'd love to hear um, about how, what those steps back were and then also what you learned and how that made you a better leader. I, can't, I believe that we're always reinventing ourselves, that life is a journey and we're always learning new things about ourselves. And you know, there, it's a constant transformational process. Um, the first time I really took a step back in my career, I had spent about 18 years of my career already in marketing. And um, I really felt that I needed to broaden who I was and what I knew and my expertise. And so I took a step back from being a vice president of marketing to being a sales rep. So it's sort of like the top of, you know, almost the top of the organization, uh, all the way back down to entry level salesperson. And I did that for about 18 months. I did three different rotations in different sales positions that I had organized with the company. And I did that so that I could continue to be a broader person. I did it so I could understand how people coming into the company um, got information, how they thought about what the marketing information they received, 
and then also to really understand our consumers and our customers from a very different place. And you, know, you go back to that time period, we had no internet, there was no Amazon. So understanding sales was how did our products come and land up on the shelf at the supermarket or at a Walmart or a Target? It was just an incredible learning experience. Um, and it was extremely challenging and it brought out totally different side of myself. Um, you know, it I became much more gregarious. I think I was very introverted as a marketer. And then all of a sudden I went into sales and you had to pitch the business. And um, I became a lot more animated and approachable. Uh, and that really served me well, because at the end of 18 months, I came back into the organization from the field and I went on to be the vice president of marketing for USA for the Mach 3 launch and all of Gillette's products. And the relationship I built with the sales organization and the former relationship I had with marketing really allowed me to be successful in the new role. The so second the, time. Before you, before you tell us the second time, I have this curiosity. Mm -hmm. What did your boss say when you said, hey, I know I'm the VP of marketing. I think I want to go do an assignment or a rotation in sales. What did they say to you? And how did you make that case that this was, this made a good idea? This was a good idea. You know, I think one of the things that I've always um, been very proud of Gillette is they were always about developing their leaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the move from one vice president role to the more significant one, it was always about broadening yourself and having more and more experiences. And so I wasn't the first to do that move. I'll be honest about that. But um, it was pretty well received. I think the thing that was important was I had agreed to a path back. Because mm. there's always a chance when you take that sideways move, which I always encourage people to do, is to ensure that you have a path back and also to make sure the sideways move that you're taking is one you're going to be relatively successful in. Um, I didn't take a sideways move into finance because I was pretty sure I was not going to be a great finance person. <laughs> so you kind of have to figure out where does the sideways move take you and can you still be successful at it? You don't have to be the best, but you do have to be successful so that you gain something that broadens you from the perspective of your organization when you come back. So when so for someone who's listening to this conversation and they're thinking, you know, I want to broaden my skill set because I want to make a bigger contribution inside of this organization over time, any recommendations on how to have that conversation? You know, I think you've got to really present it as a plan to your to your leadership and say, this is what I want to go and do. This is what I want to contribute. This is what I want to learn. And here's how it will make me more valuable to you when I come back. And I think organizations should be willing to take a risk um, to allow you to do that because if you're a great performer, it's only benefiting them to see you broaden your skill sets. Right. Okay. So you're saying talk about why you want to do it, but also really focus on how you can contribute to the organization Absolutely. as a consequence be, of that. You know, we all have to bring a benefit back to the companies that are employing us. So it, the move has to be not just for yourself, but it has to be something that the company is going to benefit from in the long run. Yeah. And it's interesting too, that you said that you, you scoped it, you said 18 months. So it wasn't forever. It's I'm going to go do this for 18 months. When I come back, I'll be able to contribute in a, a greater. Exactly. Way. And I think you have to be flexible. I don't think, you know, I, I sort of presented it to the organization as anywhere from a 12 to 24 month assignment. Um, because I know that the organization also has needs and that they want to backfill me. Are they backfilling me for two, for two years? Are they backfilling me for, they need to sort of think about it and have the flexibility to run their employee resources the correct way. All right. So that was your first big step back that allowed you to come back as a better leader. You were about to say your, your next big step back that you took. The next step back was perhaps the most um, difficult and hardest and decision I ever took. Um, I had two young children or mid-aged children, I guess for me, they were young at the time. They were, I think, eight and 12, uh, maybe a little bit older than that. And um, my mother had dementia and was in her mid-80s. And I was struggling um, to take care of my mom, take care of my two kids and work full time as a vice president of global business management, where I was traveling 50% of the time. And 
it wasn't that I wasn't delivering results, but I was finding that I didn't have the flexibility as a leader to take any sort of the hiccups that happen in business, right? If something didn't go right, I no longer had any flexibility. Um, and let's face it, you know, business is a lot about solving the problems that happen. It's about solving the hiccups. And so I think my boss at the time was clearly recognizing that I was no longer participating as a level as a team player the way I should be. And so I actually sat down with him and said, I, I just don't think I can handle the amount of stress that comes working with a global organization, trying to drive to a sales result when I have this many other things on my plate. And so we agreed that I would step down from line management. Which company was this at the time? This was Gillette. Gillette. And at the time, I was working on Oral-B. Um, and so up goes the announcement of Michelle Stacy's taking a step down into special assignments. Now, anybody who's ever seen a special assignment now, um, announcement usually says, well, that person's leaving. <laughs> And I really had no intention of leaving, nor did my boss expect me to leave. It was really a chance for me to catch my breath for a couple of years. And so I went into special assignments. I ended up doing two acquisitions and the China growth plan for oral care during my time period. I think I was in this role for about two years. And you know, it's terrifying. You don't know, you know, when you're, when you have ambitions and you want to climb that corporate ladder and you've taken special assignments, you don't know whether you're ever going back. Um, Cause you've really taken yourself out of the line role. And I was, you know, I thought, okay, well, this could be the end of my career. And, and that was perhaps the most difficult and freeing decision because the minute I gave up saying I had to climb that corporate ladder. I had to prove myself to be the best possible alternative for the next promotion. It freed me up to sort of be the me that you see right now and have a little bit of fun with my work and enjoy not just the drive for the results, but the journey along the drive. And um, at the end of two and a half years, um, unfortunately my mom did pass during that time, um, about a month after my mom passed, my boss came back and said, are you ready to come back? And um, the P&G acquisition of Gillette came along and I went into another vice president general manager role and went right back into line and really came back as a very different leader. What are some, if, if you had to encapsulate that, you, you said you were more free to be yourself because you weren't worried about what was gonna happen. Can you point to, to a situation post that step back that you managed something and you looked at yourself and you said, wow, I did that much differently than I would have two and a half years ago. Anything come to mind? You know, I think when the P&G acquisition came along and I was responsible for consolidating um, the Oral-B professional and the P&G professional oral care organizations into one, um, you know, you're in an organization that really does think about, are you going to the next role? And for me, that was no longer an issue. I didn't, I didn't care whether I got promoted again. And so I was able to really forge a different sort of relationship with both organizations. And it really was about getting people to trust you that you were going to do what's best for the total company. And in doing that, you would be doing what's best for the individual. And so I had a great experience with that, that, which can be a very difficult experience when you're putting people in new roles, et cetera. I had a lot of fun with it and I had a lot of fun with the people. And I think that, and when I also came to Keurig, the ability to lead from a place of being myself and having fun with what was coming to me, to me in terms of jobs and in terms of problems and building the business was made it easy for people to follow me. Yeah. So and so, yeah, it was a very different me that showed up. Yeah, you know, it's as I hear you talking about this, I, I there there's a, a quote from the Arbinger Institute. They wrote a book called Leadership and Self-Deception. And they talk about how, you know, the health of an organization is not how people manage up or how people manage down, but how they manage laterally. Because when you're lateral, you're effectively all at the same level. And 
what I hear you saying is that when you were lateral, you're trying to manage this, the integration of a merger, your ego was pulled out of the equation. And so it wasn't about you. It was just about making this work. And because that was your intention and also your actions informed your intention, people, they sense that it sounds like. And it, absolutely. And I think, you know, even during my current time, I always tried to be approachable. Um, you know, too often, I think as leaders, we try to be unapproachable. We try to be the one that's all buttoned up, that's always got it going right. Um, you know, I remember doing, you know, sitting at my desk one day at Keurig saying, oh my God, it's an absolutely gorgeous day. It's the first day of spring. Everybody's probably dying to be outside. And I called, I called down, I said, you know what, bring a speaker and some ice cream outside. And I wrote a note that everybody was out due to be outside for a mob dance at one o'clock in the afternoon. And the whole organization emptied the building into the courtyard. Um, and we had a mob dance and I, ice cream. And I was right out there dancing with everybody. And it was just that feeling that, oh my God, we, we're going to give you 120% every day at work, but we also have to make it a little bit fun. Oh. And we also have to show up as ourselves. I love that. What was the music? What was the song? What were some of the songs you played for the mom? Oh my God, I can't remember. It was six, <laughs> they were all dance music songs from six or eight years ago, you know, whether oh, that <laughs> but is it was absolutely so fun. wonderful fun to do that. And the other, the other memory I have about being yourself at work, um, you know, when you get into an elevator and you're the president of a company, nobody speaks to you until you speak. That's sort of the norm, right? And I remember getting into the elevator at Keurig one day and I was just a little tired and I leaned back against the door and there's a whole bunch of people and I go, I'm tired. I've watched The Bachelor too late tonight. <laughs> and the whole elevator burst out in laughter and I thought, okay, fine. And I realized that most people think I must've gone home and just read the Wall Street Journal and watched CNBC and, you know, <laughs> and read my business books. And right. this- humanize me. And I thought, well, end of story, it's six to eight people. I went to my office and it was my habit to go and pick up coffee at a different coffee station two or three times a day. Didn't always drink all that much coffee. Um, and I would go and pick up a cup of coffee and I chat with people and everybody started to come up to me and go, oh my God, isn't that Sean the best bachelor ever? And I was, I, I couldn't figure out by the third time I went to a coffee machine that people were talking to me about the bachelor. Well, I'd given them a hook into who I was. And everybody was now watching and talking about The Bachelor with me. And it was just sort of, it humanized me to an organization oh. that didn't know me that well, right? You don't know the president personally all the time. Oh, that's such a great story. So now I have to ask anything you're watching on TV right now for all of us to know. Oh, absolutely. I started The Bachelorette. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. <laughs> to, from The Bachelor to The Bachelorette. That's fantastic. It's just a way that, you know, it's funny when you work a full day, I, I enjoy to come home and not actually have to think about business. And so The Bachelor and The Bachelorette was one of those really easy things to just sit and do. <laughs> oh, I love it. Michelle, you've worked at a number of multinationals, which are, of course are the hardest to transform and disrupt, but you've done it and you've done it successfully. Can you talk about how you've done that? Um, I think the number one way to begin to think about how do you transform a business is to really come at it with a very clear vision of where that future is going to look like, where and what that future is going to look like. If you can capsulize your vision into a sentence or two, that you can clearly communicate to all the people around you that this is what you're going to do, and this is what it's going to look like, and this is what your consumer or customers going to receive. And that vision has to have two pieces to it. I believe the vision mission statement has to have a concrete objective and goal, right? But it also has to have an emotional feeling. And because people connect not just to, I wanna grow the business by 20% year over year and have 80% of consumers use my product is very dry. <laughs> right <laughs> it's hard for it, I don't even need to put what the name of the product is there because those are just objectives and goals but when you say you want to change the way people think 
about your product or you want to have people love your service or engage with you in a different way, all of a sudden you're engaging your employees in a relationship. And I do believe that we have relationships not only internally with our peers and our and our people who work for us and above us, but we have relationships with our consumers and customers. And those relationships are hinged not just on objectives and goals, but on an emotional connection. Um, it was interesting when, and it wasn't a piece of the business that I did, but when Gillette transformed shaving, they said that Gillette, you know, they could have said, we're gonna grow and get more men to shave. But what they did was say, you know, Gillette isn't, isn't about shaving. Gillette is about making a man look and feel his very best. Well, that's totally different. Not only that is it was transformational because it changed Gillette from being just about shaving, but to being about helping men look and feel their very best. And when you do that, it opens up a whole wealth of things that men might want to do to look and feel their very best in terms of products. And so transformation happens when you connect with your consumer and your customer on an emotional level that takes them someplace they aren't already. And if you can communicate that in a sentence or two, then people can follow. That statement happened in 1988 and turned into the best a man can get a year and a half later, which I think is still being used today. Wow. And that's it was transformational for the company. 30, yeah, 32 years ago. So um, how do you, how did you find, um, I mean, cause it's the kind of thing that you can talk about um, your, your vision or your purpose and these ideas, but they, they have to get communicated. Can you think of an instance where you were able to really communicate your ideas in a way that they would stick for your employees? You know, I think it's not so much the unique way, but it's doing it repeatedly and consistently. So, um, you know, at Keurig, when we set up our mission and vision, there wasn't a, a company meeting and we used to have one every other month um, with a whole company that we didn't repeat the mission and vision, that we didn't talk about it. And that under that vision and mission, there was always the 10 things that we had to accomplish this year to achieve that mission and vision. And those were just every, every quarter, every other month they were reported on. It, it became part of the vernacular. And so, you know, one of the things I feel when, you, when you're in a transformation, they don't happen overnight. They happen over years and it's getting everybody to be willing to talk about it and making sure it's the consistent message that you're delivering, that you're not changing that message all the time because everything you do should link back into your transformational message. You know, it's interesting hearing you say that because I, I, I can think of someone not too long ago that I was coaching and they said, you know, well, I've, I've told my team what our vision is and where we want to go. And I feel like I'm just repeating myself over and over again. And what you're saying is you have to say it over and over right. and over again until it's just part of your, your DNA. Exactly. And you have to make sure that the, the actions you're taking always attach to that mission and vision in some way. That yes, you're always going to have the immediate issues of the day, you know, oh my gosh, I'm out of inventory or, you know, I've got a software glitch or whatever, but your long-term actions always need to con connect to that mission and vision and never be afraid about talking about it. Michelle, how did you get people on your team to be willing to tell you, I mean, one of the things that's so hard is that when you're the, when you're the CEO of an organization, you have a hard time finding truth tellers, people who will tell you, hey, Michelle, I know that you said this is where we're going, but right now it feels like there's a little bit of disconnect between what you're saying and what we're doing. How did you get people to tell you what they were really seeing? So um, one of the things we always talk about is mentoring people in an organization. And you know, leaders sometimes think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to mentor four or five people and, and what am I gonna get out of it? I'm mentoring them. I've gotta tell you the times I have mentored people in the organization have been the most beneficial to me. 
Hmm. Uh, which is very funny. It's taking it a little bit selfishly, but I made sure that I mentored people within the organization at, at particularly Keurig at different levels and in different responsibilities. So that what became of those lunches, and I made sure I was having a lunch at least once a week with one of, one of the five or six people I mentored, is it was my chance to informally say, so what's happening? You know, <laughs> what are you hearing? And, you know, it was funny as they, you know, at first it was a little off putting for them. And then I waited a little while and, you know, over time people began to trust that they could talk to me. And that was a great way for me to hear what was going on and what people were seeing and where I needed to pay more attention or where I wasn't clear. And so it was a way that they ended up mentoring me, which was fabulous, but you have to, you have to be so incredibly trustworthy to go down that path, right? Um, but it was a really great way for me to learn how, um, what I needed to do. I have a little talk when I do it and I talk about the lunchroom. And, you know, I always say to people, if you manage people, if you are a leader of a team, um, you are the lunchroom conversation. <laughs> it, you know, they are gonna talk about you. So the question becomes, how do you wanna show up in the lunchroom conversation, right? And I used to have this little picture of a lunchroom that I kept in my drawer and I'd open it up and go, well, how are they going to talk about me today at lunch? And it made me think about making that lunchroom conversation productive, right? You didn't want them, you know, you're going to be talked about. Let's at least make sure that they're talking about you, about a decision you made or how you're moving the company forward and not what an asshole you were. Right. Now, granted, we're all human. I am sure that there are many people who have had lunchroom conversations that said, oh, my God, Michelle, Stacy, you can't believe what she did today. But for the most part, I tried to think about how do I show up in the lunchroom conversation? Oh, brilliant. Love it. It's a way to think about managing yourself because you can't be on all the time at work. But it, does, it is helpful. So over the last few months... All of us have had this forced disruption of the pandemic. In this case, the transformation was not a choice. It was forced upon all of us, very jarring. And I think there are some leaders who are worried that they're not managing well through the new normal. They're worried about the mistakes that they're making. And I'm just wondering, um, what's a major mistake that you have made in your career? And when you made that mistake, how did you get back on track? And do you have now a pattern or something that, you know, a protocol that you follow to get back on track when something just has not gone well inside your org? You know, I think I was reading an article by Inc. Magazine recently that um, was the five most underused words in business was, I'm sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> and um, I, I read those and I said, Oh my God, that is so right. Those are the most underused words. I think people expect us to be perfect and therefore we're unwilling to admit when we haven't made a right decision or when we haven't handled the situation right. And I think one of the most powerful things you can do is say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And that allows you to start with a clean slate and move on from there. Um, and I, I would be very comfortable using those words with a boss to say, you know what? I didn't deliver the right plan and we've all made big and costly business mistakes in a long career. There are gonna be things you did right and things you did wrong, or even how you might've treated a meeting um, or a person in a meeting um, or, I mean, it's just a very powerful tool. Um, and I don't want to call it a tool. It's a powerful way to transform a relationship or a business, to be willing to admit that you didn't do it right. Do you have an experience that you can recall where you did say, I'm sorry, I was wrong? Does anything come to mind? Well, I certainly have a couple of relationships I did. I, and since I'm a little bit more about relationships, I'll tell you that story. And then I'll try to think of about a business oh, one. But no, I, I had a young, let's, well, let's go with the relationship because- it all starts with a relationship inside of an organization. So fire away. Well, I had a young woman who'd come to me the night before um, a big presentation and said, Michelle, I'm going to be presenting to you tomorrow a, a recommendation on the business. It's not the recommendation that you're expecting. 
And I know it's not going to match what you're thinking about. And I said, okay, fine. And so the next day came and she came in to present. And I don't know, I must've just gotten out of this, out of bed the wrong way. And every, throughout the presentation, everything that I was doing was showing how displeased I was, you know, whether it's like, you know, leaning back, not paying attention, working on my iPhone. I was clearly giving every body signal that I was neither happy with the recommendation nor the presentation or the person. And um, I got up and when, you know, when the meeting ended, I said, thank you. And I went back to my office. Now that can be devastating from a president to a, a junior person in an organization. And I went to my office and pulled out that little picture of the lunchroom and went, oh, wow. <laughs> That's not who I wanted to be. And I realized, you know, as a leader, you can make or break somebody's day. And so I went back down to her office and um, said, you, and she was, you know, she's still a good friend of mine now. And I said, you know, I don't want to say her name, but I said, you know, I'm sorry. I was absolutely wrong in that meeting. I didn't give you the respect you needed. I didn't listen to you with an open mind. So let's go out tomorrow and have breakfast from seven to nine. Let's go over the presentation again. I don't know whether I will change my, my, my mind and move in your direction, but I owe you the chance to really pitch me your point of view. Now, when I went to her office, she was in tears. When I left, she was smiling and we did go the next day. I do know I did not follow her recommendation in the end because um, you do have to make your own decisions of, as a president, but um, we remained even closer after that. And I have mentored her and recommended her for a number of other jobs over time. Um, and we still communicate via LinkedIn and, and email and things like that. So, you know, it was powerful for her because all of a sudden, at least she had my attention. And it was also powerful because then she, when she went and told her peers, well, you know, she gave me another day. It also was very helpful to me. So it, it saved a situation that could have been perceived by a lot of people as very negative um, and particularly for her as very, as a, as career devastating. And it wasn't in the end. Um, there are business times where you do have to go in and say, you've made a mistake. Um, and I think the way I've done those is a little bit differently. It's not necessary. I, you know, fully willing to say, Hey, I made a mistake or my, first of all, as the leader of a business, you take the responsibility for any mistake your team does. You know, you don't, I, I fully believe you don't pass that mistake on and say, well, so-and-so works for me made that mistake. No. Um, so I've gone in, um, you know, I can even think about the current quality issues that we had and said, you know what? We made a mistake. We didn't, we didn't put enough quality control measures in as we were growing very fast. But then you have to say, here's my plan. Here's how I'm going to fix it. Here are, the th here are the steps I'm going to take. And the other thing is never to be afraid to ask for help. So at the time that I was running Keurig, um, the CEO, Larry Blanford, was a brilliant engineer. And so, you know, I went to him and said, I'm sorry, our team made a mistake. We didn't follow the right quality procedures as we grew the business. And I said, can you help me? My background's marketing and sales. Yours is engineering. Um, can you send me in the right direction? Can you give me some tools? Can you network me to people who might be able to help me? I didn't ask him to step in and run that piece of the business, but I asked him to assist me and network me. And then I also used a couple of outside network people that I knew from my Gillette days and said, can you help me? And I had a couple of other people who ran manufacturing for Gillette and other companies actually calling me and, and working with me every week to figure out how do I transform quality within the company? But you have to be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Here's my plan. I love it. And you know, it's interesting. You said that it was different. You, you did it slightly differently with businesses versus people. But in fact, it sounds like they're very much the same. They are. I think it's having a plan of how you want to move forward. That's a little bit more important when you're doing a bit, when you're correcting a business problem that you made the wrong decision. And, and you know what? We're all going to make 
decision, incorrect decisions from time to time. Right. One more question on that before we move on. When you have a team that has derailed and they're feeling discouraged, like, oh, how do we, you know, how do we come back from this? And you, you talked about Keurig's quality problems and people probably were discouraged. How do you rally people and say, we can do it, we can move forward? I think it's still, it comes right back to vision and mission, right? It was, you know, right away, we started to talk about our vision and mission, which was about delighting the consumer with every cup we serve. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it really said, okay, our quality issues aren't delighting the consumer. <laughs> How do we come back and delight the consumer with every cup we serve? And then, you know, when you had a very bad moment, whether it's a, ba- you know, businesses on that are facing big problems, it's finding the small wins along the way. Um, and it's making the objectives and goals, I say, very attainable. Now, within the quality problems of Keurig, we were also growing in 100% year over year. So we had a lot of wins going on, but we also had this massive quality problem. And so each, each quarter, we'd set one or two more goals around quality that, of measures that we wanted to obtain uh, achieve and business processes we wanted to complete. And so we could celebrate the wins. And I I always talk about celebrate the wins. They're very important. Mm. So you would go back to your purpose whenever, I mean, it sounds like you focus on the purpose at all times, but in an instance where there has been a, a snafu or a setback, you go back to the purpose, look for the small wins, and then just build momentum from there. Yes. All right. You serve on a number of corporate boards, including iRobot, which has the wonderful Roomba. Um, What have you learned about transformation from being on a board versus from when you were in the trenches? Oh, so the interesting thing about boards, we call them um, hands in and noses in and hands out, that you're supposed to be nosy about what is going on in the business but not try to be the one to solve the problem. Um, And so that's a little bit different as a board member, right? Because you come from an operations background where when you see something, you want to like hear the nine steps to fix it. Um, Where what we're trying to do as board members is to make sure the strategy is correct. Make sure that the resources are in place to deliver against the mission and vision. Um, and we can also talk about make sure the company's purpose around doing good and doing well is in place. So you, you're, you're looking at the company from a very different perspective than you do than when you're running the company. All right. So what would you want someone who's in the trenches to be able to see that you can see by being on a board? So you've got this perspective. In some ways, it's a bird's eye perspective. You're not in the trenches, but what would you, if you could be a a in the trenches whisperer, as it were, what would you want them to be able to see that you can see? So, you know, this is an interesting question. I've never gotten it before. Uh, I'm going to say this is the first question is, I think for all the years I was in the trenches, I always thought the CEO of the company had full realm to make all decisions. And um, when I got to the board I, board roles, I discovered that the CEO and the leadership, the C-suite leadership team doesn't have as much freedom as you might think they do. They have a board that they report to and the board can have a variety of, of very strong opinions. So um, I guess I would say is to remember that your senior leadership team isn't always completely free to do exactly what they might want to do or um, to give you a clear answer right away because they do serve either their shareholders or their board. So the CEO has a boss in a-, in a- Absolutely. I think that's the first thing they really realize is that the CEO and the C-suite has a boss. Um, and in all cases, it's always a shareholder who's represented by the board of directors. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's kind of interesting because even as you go into um, cause they sit on some smaller companies that are privately held companies and um, know that the, the CEO there even has more strongly strong board members because those board members are usually their investors. And um, so you're spending their money and they have a big say so about how you want, how they might want their money to be spent. So I, I would say that usually, you know, it, they don't have always as much freedom as you might think that they do. And they have a group of people that they serve and it does take a lot of their time as well. Um, 
so I think that's the first thing I would say. Yeah. So um, commenting on that for a minute, it's an, it's an interesting observation because I think if you're if, a couple of things, I guess, is for a person who is a CEO, who's realizing, oh, I thought I was at the top of the heap. And in fact, I'm not because I still have a whole nother group of stakeholders that I report into. It's interesting, I think, for a CEO to realize or even the C-suite to understand the experience that I'm having, and I used to have that, but I had forgotten, unless you're an entrepreneur who started a company, but the experience I'm having is the experience that many of the people inside of our company have every day, that frozen middle of trying to make things happen. And so that's interesting to think about that experience as well um, that the CEO is having and possibly compassion or empathy for people who are mid-level trying to work their, work their ideas through the organization. It, exactly. And, and I think that's where I think I was most surprised coming into the board roles of seeing the amount of influence and time that the board can take um, of the CEO and of the C-suite and how as board members, we can really generate work, um, which is another thing. If you're, if you're thinking about being on a board, remember that you can generate a lot of work, which you might not always want to do. So Michelle, depending on what statistics you're looking at, 85% of all employees are disengaged. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's, it's fascinating that we as leaders sometimes forget that our employees are our greatest resource. And the only thing in an organization that can create are our employees. Machines, tools, and processes don't create. And the other thing that I found fascinating, um, someone once told me that everybody comes to work with the intent to do a great job. I imagine that there's no one who's going to be listening to this webinar who said, well, I got up today to really suck at work. You know, people come to work to do a good job and somewhere along the way we lose them. And I think that part of that is that we tend to always focus on the great motivated performers, right? The ones who come in every day and they're ready to charge and boy, it's so easy to work with those people. And the reality is those are the people that don't need us as much as leaders. And we need to focus on all of the people on our teams and to really focus on the middle. Um, you know, I'll use a football analogy, which for me as a woman is really odd, but you know, it's, if you don't have a great front line, that quarterback's not going to do very much, but most people can't tell you what the name of the center is on a football team, right? But these are the people that you can't win without. And so we have to learn to focus on the middle. We have to learn to motivate them to make sure that they've got incentives to perform. They've got to make sure that we're praising them as much as we're praising that one who's coming in, you know, ready to go every single day so that the whole team moves forward. And part of the other piece I'm going to say, there are two other pieces of this. The next piece is about ourselves as leaders. We can't expect our teams to be motivated and engaged if we're not engaged. Mm -hmm. And so we have to check every, you know, multiple times a day, am I engaged? Am I excited about what's going on? Am I leading with enthusiasm? And we can't do it all the time. Um, are we praising people for work well done? Are we giving criticism that's constructive and are we helping people to become their very best? Because that's what people want. And the last piece is, are we an organization that has a purpose and a culture that people feel they're doing more than just delivering business results? Okay, so <clears throat> that leads me to another question because we, you know, we talk a lot, this idea of business mission um, but then there's this idea of purpose and in what ways, because we're driven by our purpose ultimately. So in what ways did you find as a leader or have you found as a leader that you can deliver a culture of purpose? You know, I think every company has sort of a, a, a mission and vision. So Craig, I'll, I'll define mission and vision versus purpose. The mission and vision was to delight the consumer with every cup we serve. Um, the purpose was to brew a better world and to give back. And brewing a better world was about giving back to the communities that we were in and the communities that helped to build our business. So the coffee communities, the manufacturing communities, et cetera. And when those two can come together, 
is when there's real power. Almost every company now is thinking about how do they set a purpose for the communities in which they're in and, they, and, and their employees and the communities they serve. But it's really then starting to put actions behind those purposes. So one of the things um, we did at Green Mountain Coffee Roasters and Keurig was a division of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters is we gave people 45 hours of community service uh, a year. So that's a week and a half, a week and a day. It was six days that our employees could go out and work in the community in some sort of way. That's a lot of time. And people would look at us back at the time and go, oh my God, how can you let your employees go? You're growing at 100% and you're losing a week and a day of people's time every single, you know, over a course of a year, that's a lot of time. And I said, it's the best thing we ever did. Because every week you would come into the lobby of Keurig and we would have that, the, the number of different items that people could do that week. You could go to build a house for Habitat for Humanity. You could go and do a food kitchen. You could go and do um, something for the military children. You could build bicycles for um, underprivileged children. There was something every single day and every week that showed up and you could sign up for. And what it created was tremendous links across functionally. That, you know, if I went to do a Habitat for Humanity, I went with people from finance and people from manufacturing and people from R&D and all levels. And I met people that I would never have met if I hadn't done that. And that was happening for everybody. So the blinders of this was my organization and my team and my floor and my corner got completely broken down because people were constantly mixing to go to different events. And the other thing was people felt that they were doing more than just working to serve the shareholders of the company. They felt they were working to benefit their communities that um, in addition to the service that people could do, but we also were regularly donating money to the charities that we were also helping to volunteer for. It just made the company feel like there was, there was another thing about than just sales and profit. Mm -hmm. And it created a purpose and a culture around purpose. And by the way, if you're in Habitat for Humanity and you're hammering on a board with somebody to try to build a, a doorway or install a bathroom, the next day you're not telling them they're an asshole in the team meeting. <laughs> it just, it just didn't happen. You were all working together at a common purpose. So the attitudes of what was acceptable within the office was often started by what was acceptable when you were working together as a volunteer. It was just a very powerful way to build purpose. And so, if that, and that's just one example, but as companies, and I've read a little bit about your company and, and the types of purpose you're thinking about, the more you put that into action, the more you find ways to serve the community, the more you build employee loyalty, and the longer you have, you keep your employees, the better it is for you. Mm. Mm. What a wonderful way to end our conversation. That is really amazing. And I, I just love that idea of you're doing good. People feel the sense of purpose. And at the same time, they're finding ways to work together and, and, and those relationships are far more meaningful. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share, Michelle? Um, you know, I guess the, the pieces that I will say is just as a summary, it's about being able to communicate vision and mission it's about bringing yourself to work every day as a genuine human that's not afraid to say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, um, that's engaged, um, that's in relationship with people. And then it's tying it back that in the end of the day, we are about doing good while doing well. And that, that organizations that can do that and people who can do that are the ones that I believe in the long run are really gonna succeed and move us forward. Before I leave you, I wanna play a video that has had a tremendous impact on me and how I feel I can influence people in the world. So as I close and I leave you, I have one message, let your own light shine. So a huge thanks to Michelle, Stacy, and Whitney Johnson. What an amazing conversation to be uh, capable of, of, of listening into and, and learning from. We have more of the same caliber coming to you 
Uh, we have here in roughly half an hour, we're going to be joined on the main stage by Don Tashcott, who will give the first talk of the day. And until then, there are several different things you can explore. There's a panel discussion on Education 2.0. There are, there's the Knowledge Hub you can delve into and learn more about our partners. And there's the discussion forums and for some of you, the round tables that you can join as well. Feel free to explore and we will see you back here 30 past the hour in roughly half an hour for the talk with Don Tapscott.